But about those rare conditions, the other one of those rare ones, not in your respective disorders. Though those people who are regularly doing large volume implants, I'm sure they would say it's not that rare. It's uh, commonly found by them. So the normal cases start in 91 with the name called auditory neuropathy, where they thought it was a timing disorder. And later, so they also found that it's not just the timing in the nerve that is wrong, but also there's some more dyssynchronous function of the eighth nerve. So the, uh, the speech that would go in would not exactly reach the cortex properly. So they said there's some dyssynchrony in it. So in about 98, they call it auditory dyssynchrony. So early is auditory neuropathy, we'll find some text called AD, auditory dyssynchrony. And 2008, Italy, there was a concern statement where they said that they combined all the results of auditory neuropathy. Spectrum disorder, so presently called ASPC. So, what is auditory neuropathy? Auditory neuropathy is a condition where you have a normal outer hairs. You know the sound path from the outer hairs, inner hairs, and then into the nerve. So, for the inner hairs onwards, there is some defect that the uh, whatever sound impulses that are there are not passing onto the nerve. So, any defect from the inner hairs to the auditory cortex is the presence of auditory neuropathy. So, in these conditions, what you normally find? You find that the evidence of normal outer has a function of the cochlea. So, like we were just discussing photoacoustic emissions as part of cochlea hairs. So you will have a present or a positive or a pass in a photoacoustic emissions. The cochlea microphones may be also present in auditory brain in response. Again, but the neural impairment is there. Neural impairment will be formed by an absence of area. It may be abnormal or absent area. Take it acoustic septal reflex. We were just we were discussing about the three tests that you would do acoustic septal reflex because it takes the nerve and comes back to seven nerve caucus. Even the nerve there is a problem, there would be an absence of an acoustic septal reflex, absent an abnormal one. Auditor can range from a normal to profound. Now, the various auditors that you can have as well, or at least you know. In other words, putting it simply, the hearing disorder which sounds comes into the inner ear normally. But the conduction signals from the inner ear to the brain are impaired. Basically, they may involve damage to the inner hairs or maybe due to faulty links between the inner hairs and So you can have a normal, sorry, you can have a normal outer hairs, but you can have a problem from the inner hairs. So what's the prevalence? Ten percent children with severe to profound deafness may have a neural rather than a hairs. There appears to be equal distribution male to female. Eighty percent of them had either family or neonatal risk factors. In some of the studies here show the case of an atlas infant population. It's from about one to four percent. In patients with permanent hearing loss, it can be from about five percent to fifteen percent. That's about ten to twelve percent of total total infections. So, what are the possible sites? As I said. It can be from inner hairs, the tectoral member, auditory nerve, the eighth nerve. It can be neural problem or external or demyelination of the nerve. It can be the effect on the efferent as well as the effect. Etiology, usually anoxia, or the other common ones are hyperbilirubinemia, birth, infectious diseases, immune disorders. 15 25 percent cases may find no risk factors at all. Large slight wind, many risk factors that can be there. Genetic as well as non genetic causes which can cause non genetic Some of the studies also found that the mutation of the portofolus gene which will lead to our genetic So, what are the characteristics? The intensity processing is not significantly affected. That means that I said that. Patient may, the child may have or the patient may have a normal to profound hearing loss. So the intensity may not be much affected, but frequency discrimination is affected. Significantly low, especially the high frequencies. The temporal processing defect is there because that's what the high frequency will be affected. Speech recognition defects deficit that is disproportionate to Kyoto loss. So the Kyoto loss, but the speech discrimination is much more than what the Kyoto loss has. There are various variations now. We get a little bit more complex. It is so simple to okay. We get more complex. Here, the large individual variations. Some of them the hearing may improve over time. This may take the hyperbilirubin. Hearing may stay the same. Hearing may get worse, and there may be total loss of even the outer hairs. 
A hearing loss can fluctuate over time with good hearing and bad. Other variations are they can have people can have clear mainly sensory motor neuropathy. There may be other motor neuropathy that will present other than that this. Then or they may be present just no apparent other neuropathy at all. Or they may find no signs of neuropathy other than the auditory findings. You may have this unilateral or not bilateral. Something may have a temperature sensitive agency. Some of them have cardiac tendency, which is less than the genetic cause. So as I said, what are the characters of the hearing loss? They can be variable hearing loss, from mild to moderate to severe. So what's happening is, as you see here, so uh, the original waveform, as you can see in the first part, I'm going to put on, how do you do the one? Front portion. <coughs> waveform that you find. If you find a signal that is passed, you find it being scattered well. As you see with mild, moderate, severe neuropathy, these waveforms are getting all clubbed together. So the discrimination of speech is being affected here. Also when you are hearing your voice, if you are hearing a sentence, there is a gap between each word. So when the gap is present, that makes you understand the sentence better. So like this, my house is your house, there is a gap between each. In the case of neuropathy, what happens is the gap is lost. Once the gap is lost, the individual hears it as a continuous thing and not able to discriminate between each sentence or each word. So gap detection can be affected. So how do you manage it? Typical management is as the same, complete medical history, autoscopic examination, photoacoustic emission testing, VERA, Behavior modification for checking out if actually what is reaching, what is saying is actually reaching the brain or is it the cortical problem. Hip and eventually the cosmic reflexes. So why is case history so important? Yes, as you know, we told so many causes. They can be genetic cause, they can be variable the cause, they can be insult to the patient, etc. Which can cause these loss. So these are all important to find the history. For that, you can also find the history that whether when you did the universal hearing screening, many of the people may have passed the universal hearing screening because you just did a OE and the OE was passed. But you didn't do the APR to find that the child had actually had an auditory neuropathy, you would have failed in the APR. That usually have robust OEs because of the outer hair surface is intact. APR is negative, abnormal or absent APRs. We would also like to do the behavioral auditory in these two. The reason for understanding behavioral auditory is yes, you can say you have an APR, you have a outer hazards present, but the, it's a test to understand actually is the child able to hear it, is it actually going to play, is it the particle uh, uh, evaluated to whatever the sound is happening. This procedure is most appropriate for children in the 6 months or 3 years of age. Impanometry, as I told you, impanometry is to rule out any middle ear cause, impanometry may be normal in these conditions, but their cause may be absent. The summary of this, OE will be normal, dependent on normal, mid-tail reflex absent, cochlear microphone present, where are absent, speech to noise generally poor, speech to noise wide, normal to severe, pure work settles, very So, how do we treat them? We all know we treat them multidisciplinary. So, the normal aspect goes for any cochlear implantation or for any other such uh, child who comes, we go through multidisciplinary for the pediatric, <coughs> neurologist, speech pathologist. So what are the patient outcomes in these? Some actually get better. That's a good thing to know. Some actually get better, start to hear and speak in the year or two. In the case of hypercalculinemia, these, these children usually may actually improve. Some get worse, some stay the same, some develop other peripheral neurons. So what are the ongoing audiological strategies to manage these children? So follow patient audiologically. Define hearing sensitivity behavioral auditory. Next is hearing aid fitting. Just don't go for the detection of sound, but also the perception of sound. Like I said, the person may be able to detect sound, but not able to understand the sound. And consider cochlear implantation. Joker is not indicated. Or the cochlear implant considered as a good candidate. Please come to that. 
So in application getting it, and now how do you do the application getting it? You need to know what is the threshold. How do you find a threshold in this time? You do a pair up, pair is not there. How do you get a threshold in this time? So how to set the hearing aid? So you may have to have some time wait to get the behavior threshold. You may have to wait for about six months. Actually, against all your ideas of 